Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Today I wanted to share with you a couple of old Life magazines I got from back in the 1950s. And as you can see, these are special for us stamp collectors because they have cover stories all about stamps. And I'll get into the details on those stories in just a moment. But let me just take a moment to explain about Life Magazine. For those of you who are much younger than me, while the name Life Magazine goes back to 1883, this magazine actually started in 1936 when publisher Henry Luce of Time Magazine, he bought the Life Magazine that existed at the time, but he didn't care anything about the magazine. He just wanted the title. He wanted that name, Life Magazine, for himself. And he started a new Life Magazine from the ground up. It was the first all photographic news magazine in America. And for the next 36 years, it ruled the weekly magazine market and became highly regarded for its uh, photojournalism. Some of the greatest names in photojournalism, the best photographers in America and uh, from other parts of the world too. The best photographers worked for, uh, for Life magazine. Names like Alfred Eisenstadt, uh, Margaret Burke White, uh, Gordon Parks, uh, many, many, many more. Which is all by way of saying that to have two uh, issues devoted to stamps in a five-year period, well, actually it's almost six years between issues, but uh, it just goes to show you how seriously that you know stamps were accepted by you know mainstream media and and the public. Uh, this was a magazine with over six million uh, circulation. <clears throat> Now this first issue from May of 1954, it's devoted to the world's rarest stamps. You'll notice on the cover it states, first time in color. That's because it was only two years earlier in 1952 that the U.S. government changed federal regulations that restricted the reproduction of uh, foreign postage stamps to black and white. Now they could be reproduced in color. However, U.S. postage stamps were still only allowed to be reproduced in black and white. It's fun to look through these old magazines, uh, these old ads. <laughs> Here's one for uh, the anti-knock compound uh, ethyl. All right, guess your best. Who is this? Yep, that is Mr. NRA himself, Charlton Heston, starring in Paramount Pictures, Secret of the Incas. And he's wearing a Van Heusen shirt. Anyways, let's get to the main event. Here we go, the stamp album worth a million bucks. Now that's just pocket change. For the first time, life brings world's classics together. They start, of course, by showing the British Guiana one cent magenta. At that time, valued at around $100,000. And on the right side is the back side of the stamp, where tradition holds that each owner leaves his mark on it. That tradition started with its what third or fourth owner, actually, Count uh, Philippe von Ferrari. His mark was at Fleur de Lis. After Ferrari, the owner was Arthur Hind, who left a clover and the letters A-H as his mark. And you can't see that, can you? Well, look at the 17-pointed star. Underneath it is the A-H and clover. The 17-pointed star came by way of Anne Hind, Arthur's widow. When Arthur died, in his will, he bequeathed everything he owned to his wife, Anne, except his stamp collection. Anne wasn't going to have any of that, so she sued for possession, claiming that Arthur had already given her the stamp collection before he died. 
and the court sided with her. She then, out of spite, I presume, placed her own mark obscuring Arthur's. And then the third owner after that, the third mark on there is a comet that belongs to, at that time, an anonymous owner, but who is now known to have been an Australian engineer named Frederick T. Small. But enough about the magenta. Let's go back to Life magazine. Turn the page and we see an almost two-page spread of some of the great rarities of the world. These include, in the center there, the Sweden three shilling yellow, valued at forty thousand dollars at that time, and that is the most, and that is the rarest European stamp. They also, of course, show the one cent post office Mauritius, valued at twenty thousand, and then they go all the way down to fifteen hundred dollars. Like this, like this 1869 France five franc error with the value omitted. There's also a pair of basil doves valued at $1,500. And this one from Newfoundland, overprinted for the first transatlantic air post flight attempt. If you're wondering why you haven't seen the U.S. inverted Jenny, well, you got to remember there was a sheet of 100 of those found. So, comparatively speaking, that is not even a world-class rarity. It's just expensive because it's popular. The next three pages are given over to rare covers. Have to back up a little bit to show you this one. This cover, franked with two of the one cent post office Mauritius, valued at that time at $75,000. Coming back, this cover with two Hawaiian missionaries was valued at $35,000. Right next door, we have this, this cover with a block of four Cape of Good Hope triangle stamps. And the two on the left are uh, one penny stamps and the two on the right are four pennies. But the four penny is a color of error. And that one was valued at 12,500. The third page is all about provisional Confederate States covers. That means the stamps on them were provisional stamps uh, created by local postmasters before <clears throat> the Confederate States of American government had uh, official stamps printed up. Now all of these covers belong to one collector who is anonymous. He's known in this article only as Pacificus. And the covers range in value from you know, $6,000, $3,500, 5000 Number nine, Livingston, Alabama was 12000 Looks like the most expensive. Which one is that? Number nine, that's down here. Livingston, Alabama, provisional stamp. The next page over just shows some miscellaneous other rarities. Here is a block of 48 of the 1840 Great Britain two penny blue, two pence blue, tuppence blue. <laughs> and this was only brought to light to general knowledge in uh, 1946 
when a secretary to Scotland's Duke of Bucklew found a partial sheet, this partial sheet, while rummaging through an old desk. And then some of the other stamps are these stamps of the Philippines, overprinted with the word victory, and once the Americans uh, had secured defeat, I mean, <laughs> had secured victory. St. Pierre and Miquelon, Liberia, another first flight stamp, which got delayed by a year. Here's a similar story to the inverted Jenny, where the collector bought a sheet of 50 and discovered the inverted center. And that was the only sheet ever found. This is just a, to illustrate a point that not all stamps go up. This one was highly speculative when it came out. Everybody thought it was going up in value and they paid crazy prices for it. And uh, within a short time, the prices just came tumbling back down. Next page is not about rarities. It's just some uh, interesting stories behind some stamps. The King of Bulgaria, King Boris III, his whole life was just chronicled from cradle to death <laughs> with postage stamps marking important events along the way. And we have some controversial stamps. This one, the uh, Dominican Republic, they drew it with a disputed border. You notice how it's kind of snake snakes around. It should actually be more or less a straight line. Haiti didn't take to that and started rattling their sabers and the Dominican finally retracted it, issued a new one. Uh, you probably know about this one, Nicaragua's smoking volcano, which was used as propaganda to convince uh, the Panama Canal to be built in Panama instead of Nicaragua. This one caused a scandal when it came out. Uh, Spain issued this to honor the, you know, the famous painter Goya by uh, reproducing one of his nude paintings. And they got worldwide criticism. So what did Spain do? Uh, they just printed millions more. We are King Ferdinand. Well, he wanted he wanted to have his face on the stamps, but he didn't want to be uh, he didn't want to have his face defaced, so to speak. So the post office came up with a special cancel horseshoe shaped that would go all around him and not deface him. Here's another political dispute. Falkland Islands came out with this stamp in 1933, and uh, of course Argentina still claims territorial rights. And then this third little feature on this page just gives a brief account of uh, the short life and death of independent Latvia from after World War I until they got sucked up again by Germany and then Russia. Over here you'll notice the black and white. That must mean there are U.S. stamps. These are all U.S. errors. I won't spend a lot of time, or any time for that matter, telling you about these. You're probably all familiar. Except maybe this one. The 1931 Lost Cross. Out of 99 million stamps printed, out of every sheet, one sheet was found with one stamp missing the Red Cross. And back then it was valued at 10,000. I haven't looked lately. I'll put a little 
uh, subtitle later in editing after I find out what it's worth today. Let's move along. Oh, that's all about, that's all the stamps. Then they go give us a feature about Count Philippe von Ferrari himself, the world's greatest collector. You just don't know what stamps can do to a man. And they go into pretty much pretty good detail about his story. They cover one column, two columns, a third page. Two connoisseurs, H.R. Harmer and Maurice Burris. And one more page. Oh, they say here, there are no more titans today. No, no larger than life figures in the stamp world. It looks like the end. Oh no, there's still one more thing. They provide you a key to all of the stamps pictured on the front cover. So that's it. Here's a, a look at the date again. I'll put these dates in the uh, description box below too. So if you're interested in finding these magazines, you can go to eBay or whatever, Etsy, anywhere else looking for your copy. Let's go on to the second issue. This one took a completely different approach to the story. Instead of talking about all the rarities, these are just common stamps, but they are the world's prettiest. And that's not of all time. This is actually from, from uh, current issues because what they said was, uh, let me give you a good look at this one too, November 30th, 1959. Oh, also this was a Fold out cover. Give you a good look at a bunch of stamps printed in a much, much larger size. And many of you will recognize these from your beginning days as just very minimal catalog value stamps, what we call packet material. These are stamps that you would find in a packet of say, you know, 50 for a dollar, maybe 50, 50 for 25 cents back then. Now the editor's foreword is pretty interesting because they, they tell you the trouble that they went to uh, to get these stamps canceled. Now let me show you the front again. You'll, You'll notice that all the stamps are canceled. Like we said, the uh, United States government requires by law that any foreign stamps reproduced have to be canceled. And you notice they all have barely there cancels in the corner. That's because they were familiar with the canceled order stamps that typically look like this. They just obtrude into the picture. So what they did, they took all of their stamps that they wanted to reproduce, they mailed them off to every country to the postal department asking them to put the slightest cancel possible that they could on there. Just a little mark in the corner. And they all complied, except for two. Portuguese, where's my finger? There. Portuguese Angola and Mozambique. They were returned, but they looked just as bad as your typical CTOs. So they sent off another one with instructions. Do it right this time. Well, those stamps, where's my finger again? Those stamps got lost in transit. So with time pressing, a deadline approaching, 
We sent our own correspondence to Mozambique and Angola. Together they managed to get the job done neatly. So on to the stamps. Well, have a little nip first, eh? Here we go, the beauty in stamps. First page. A picture in the border, all these wildlife animals from Africa, different African countries. They talk about how after the war, uh, they weren't so much into making pictorials, you know, it was all uh, monarchs and presidents and just stately stuff. And they started uh, getting a little more creative after the war. As they say here, it's only since World War II that most nations have awakened to the fact that beautiful stamps contribute to national prestige, attract tourists, and also provide a steady income. Of course, there's always the income to be made. So more and more postal services started hiring uh, fine artists to design the stamps. And along with that, they had better technology for printing the stamps. Next page, we got two pages full of birds, fish, and lovely insects. Here we go, Angola. This is what they flew to the ends of the earth to get. <laughs> and they. They did get their little tiny corner cancels. And those are pretty, 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 pretty birdies. <laughs> Ecuador, Yugoslavia, butterflies, fish, nor butterflies. By the way, the cover said 288 of the world's most beautiful stamps. I'm not counting, so I'll trust them. Next, we have a charming profusion of flowers and mushrooms. and a printing flaw. I want my money back. Or maybe this is a rare issue of life now. Next, they show displays of culture, costumes from Japan, from Laos. Remember these Laos stamps. I'm telling you, keep it in your mind right now. I'll get back to them in a, just a moment. Monaco, Turkey, Greece. Oh, then there, there's Angola again. So, on the final page, they say the best for last, the best of them all, fine engravings. Here's an example from Poland uh, by Lukaszewski, the engraver. Netherlands honoring Rembrandt. And then here's some famous men from Yugoslavia. And they do note part of the beauty of uh, engraved stamps is that some of them are so finely engraved and so intricate that they can be blown up to huge sizes and still maintain their detail and their beauty. Here they have a full page blow up of this Austrian stamp. Also from a engraver that I'm not familiar with, Vo Voiti. Hmm. 
Uh, only one problem with this article, it didn't mention, of course, Cheswav Swanya. Now, as I said, you remember those stamps of Laos? Here's the guy who painted them. His name is, what is his name? Oh yeah, his name is Marc Leguay. And he was, uh, he came from France 25 years prior to this issue. And he was friends with the, with a postal official. And they got together when uh, uh, Laos first started to issue stamps in 1951. The postal uh, officer said he'd come up with the designs and Mark can draw them, paint them, and create the stamps. And you'll notice the boy on this stamp is the boy in this picture. The boy in this picture is one of Mark Leguay's sons. In fact, he has plenty of models to choose from, so it may be tough for you to find any particular, you know, model repeated on a stamp because, as they point out in the article, he has a wife, he has a mistress, and he has at least 25 children. He says he never counted them. <laughs> More of his children, which became a postage stamp. Another postage stamp created from one of his children. And that wraps it up for that, that stamp issue. So I hope you enjoyed this look at these two Life magazines. And I thank you for joining me today. And until next time, I wish you all happy stamping. <laughs>